Michael Patrick Shields is on the air. Good morning, world. Good morning, Michigan. A very pleasant Tuesday to you. Good morning, Mount Pleasant, Petoskey, Traverse City, Hastings, Lansing, Sagadaw, Manistee, Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo, Ludington, Muskegon, and everywhere in between. It's Michael Patrick Shields with you, and glad to be here. We're going to talk automotive this morning because lots of things are happening at once. Very good news. The stock price for the Ford Motor Company is way up. Uh, the potential for General Motors stock, the initial public offering coming this week. Should you buy in and what will the price be? And the Chrysler Corporation getting kudos and separating their brands. What does it all mean this morning? Is the American auto industry on the way back? Our anchorman Gary Austin has a disturbing story, a mysterious story of murder that has to do with Michigan and Sin City. What's up, Gary? Boy, MPS, this is a real strange case, and police are baffled. It involves 23-year-old Josh Dufort, a recent grad from Dansville High. That's in the greater Lansing area. So he was in Las Vegas, right? And uh, he wanted to be an actor, and he had some connections down there, so that was his thing. He wanted to, he wanted to pursue that. Well, he was out for a jog the other day, and um, his body was found not long after he went out. Now, police say he had been beaten and strangled. This happened last Monday. Now, apparently, he did make one last cell phone call to a friend, and here's what he said. Come and get me. They are here. Come and get me. They are here. Now, no one knows who the they he was referring to, so this mystery deepens, MPS. His family now offering a $5,000 reward um, for any information that leads to an arrest in this very unusual case that police in Vegas are now calling a murder. That is eerie and obviously tragic. Uh, yesterday it was 50 degrees and sunny. Couldn't yes. have been nicer for hunting, but it mm. turns out the state wildlife officials are saying it appears that fewer hunters than normal turned out. Mm at hunting areas, and uh, I don't know, is it because it was on a Monday? Does that make it more complicated? I, I don't know. I, I, mean, I just wonder. Um, shouldn't they do, wouldn't it be a good idea to standardize the start of hunting season and maybe make it a Saturday morning? Yeah, you know, I, I, I guess. Um, I guess MP, MPS, too, the, the, there's concern that uh, maybe uh, more folks are more inclined to say, you know what, be better pass on the hunting thing because work is more important. Well, that's what I mean. I mean, if you put it on Saturday morning at first light, they could depend on the weekend at least. I just maybe more hunters are thinking that they just maybe will pass on hunting, you Mm. know, entirely this year because um, the job and the income and a lot of folks working two jobs now, sometimes more to get by. Maybe that's taking precedence now over Mm. hunting. I mean, (laughs) a lot of hunters maybe years ago said, well, that will never happen to me. No way would I when I bypass the, the hunting season, but maybe more people are opting to do that because of the financial situation and the economy being in the kind of shape it's in. Who knows? The Dow was up nine yesterday. The S&P lost a point, and the NASDAQ was down four points. And Larry Summers, who is the outgoing White House economic advisor, says the U.S. economy is doing well compared to the rest of the world, mm. but it has to start exporting more. That's uh, his idea. Um, I have a very interesting guest here this morning, Mr. Gary Austin. There was a, sort of a spooky story, I guess I would say. And I know it's not Halloween anymore, but several Roman Catholic priests and bishops from around the nation attended an exorcism conference over the weekend hmm. in Baltimore. This is not out of a movie. This is reality. 100 priests and bishops learned when to exercise demons from someone who's possessed. And uh, apparently there are uh, people who have uh, exorcisms performed who don't really need the ritual, but somehow they've got it in their head. And so church officials are saying the ritual is very rare, but it does take place Hmm. in certain extraordinary situations. I had no idea. It's real. It's not just in the movies. And Father Mark Inglet, the pastor of uh, St. John's uh, Student Parish and uh, also uh, St. Thomas Aquinas here in the state capital area is up early with us. Hopefully he's got the lights on in the room he's in this morning so he doesn't get spooked out. Good morning, Father. Good morning, Michael Patrick, and I have my crucifix right here. Oh, very good, very good. Now, um, you know, this is one of those things that people see in the movies but uh, maybe don't realize is actually part of church doctrine, isn't it? Well, it is. And, you know, actually it's it's a very ancient rite. Um, Exorcism has its roots, you know, in the New Testament where casts out evil spirits and demons, and um, you know, so it's, it, like you said, it's 
beginning, though, it, it, it is very rare. And, and I think what's going on, too, in the church's response, that's why I think they had the meeting, is, you know, when things get bad, people start believing in God and the devil again. <laughs> and I think things are pretty bad. And so people are, are starting to uh, turn to God, but they're also trying to turn to, you know, I think they turn to the devil to explain all the evil and the fears um, and you know, those kinds of things that are going on in the world. And, and, and the response, I think, is that, you know, the, what's, what's happening is people are starting to call and ask for the right of exorcism more and more. Um, every diocese has a priest that's appointed by the bishop that should be handling this. Mm-hmm. But I, I guess there are five or six, from what I understand, priests in the country that are, are kind of overwhelmed by the requests that they're getting. So mm. the bishops, in addition to all the other good things that they're talking about, you know, they're talking about other demons, too, like, you know, racism and sexism and injustice and care of the elderly and health care and reproductive technologies and uh, all kinds of other you know, things yeah, that might be but, more practical. Uh... This is not figurative, though. This is literal. In other words, I know there will be some mother who will drag their uh, seven-year-old down to the church and say, this kid will not listen, and he won't do his homework, and he's playing in the mud all the time. That He's got the devil in him. That's not real. But there are real cases of demonic possession? Yeah, well, you know, there are cases when psychologists and sociologists and medical science can't explain the phenomenon, and that's when the church does get involved. Like I say, it's very rare, you know. I think one of the articles I read said out of the 400 inquiries, maybe three or four deserve an actual exorcism. But I, I think it's as real as it was when Jesus had to deal with it in, in the New Testament. Have you ever come across one or been involved in one? Uh, I have not. Um, okay. I've come across some very eerie, scary phenomena, and that's for sure. You have? What comes to mind as the eeriest and scariest? Well, I mean, there's one time, it, it was right here, I mean, in East Lansing, some students called and said that there was a room in their house that was just very cold. Mm-hmm. And this was in the heat of the summer, and they did not have air conditioning, and they just couldn't explain it. And so I, I went, and I just prayed in the room, went to the room with holy water, and um, we found out later that there was a suicide in that room. Oh. And so that, and I guess that's the closest I've ever come. And, and they didn't have any problems after that. Um, mm. but just, um, My bedroom is cold, but that's a different matter altogether. That, I mean, I, I, look, I checked their air ducts, and I checked outside <laughs> to make sure they didn't have air conditioning. Um, it's, it's just that you can't explain it. Wow. Now, um, there are certain criteria, and, and you were taught this when you were learning to be a priest. I mean, do they, do they teach every priest? Do you, do you, is there a class, you know, exorcism? No, actually, they don't. And, and that's why I think they had this conference. It's something that... Um, that we're not taught. Oh. It's something that we're not supposed to be um, doing. Like um, every bishop is supposed to appoint a priest in his diocese. In fact, sometimes, you know, priests in Lansing, we sit around and wonder who it is. Oh. Because you know, what we're supposed to do is contact the bishop, the bishop will contact the priest. And they'll so, take care of it. It's a secret. So it's even more mysterious because someone in the diocese in which you live is sort of the exorcist then. That's right. That's wow. So it's supposed to be. But obviously, you know, they had this conference because a lot of the dioceses don't have it and hmm. um, haven't had it. But I, I, like I say, I think, you know, what times are getting bad. Yeah. Times get bad, people start believing God and believing in the devil again. And But uh, as I understand it, the, the way that you can tell that someone is actually possessed by a demon, according to the Church anyway, they speak a language that they don't ordinarily know, they show great physical strength, they become turned off by holy water, prayers, and the crucifix. They have a reaction like that. And maybe they have knowledge of events that they wouldn't, you know, have any knowledge of. Yeah, yeah. That's really I, scary. It is. Well, I, I think evil is scary, and, and there is a God, and there is a devil. And um, sometimes, I think he, may, he, for some strange reason, the devil will manifest himself um, like he does. Not often. Um, and, you know, I think the, the bottom line is, um, you know, God has much more power over Satan than Satan has over you know, us. Do you think so, that the uh, the possessed people are not as dramatic as it seems in the movies? Is it is it a little more subtle? Would you guess? You know, sometimes it is. Sometimes I, I think that the movie The Exorcist. Um, I think that does kind of dramatize things a little bit. But I I, I think that that's kind of the extreme. Mm-hmm. Um, Have you ever met someone and the second you met them, you said, "Hmm, this person's evil." 
Um, no, I, I think sometimes that what I see is people doing evil things, but that doesn't make the person evil. Mm. You know, I think good people do bad things. Bad people. Well, I hope, uh, if you don't mind, in Mass this morning, you'll say a little prayer to protect us all, maybe to St. Michael, uh, from just plain evil thoughts or evil people, and we'd sure appreciate that this morning. Father Mark, Father Mark Inglet, God bless you as we head into the holiday season, too, from uh, St. John Student Parish and St. Thomas Aquinas Parish in the state capital area at 18 minutes after the hour. It's Michael Patrick Shields. 22 minutes after the hour, Michael Patrick Shields heard all across the state of Michigan. We're going to talk about cars. Uh, first, though, uh, following up on Father Mark Inglis' interview from Jackson, Michigan. A 52-year-old man's been accused of donning a priest's robe to steal parishioner donations from a church, and he's been arrested. He stole an undisclosed amount of money and checks from uh, St. John Catholic Church at 4.30 on Saturday. He used the robe to get access to the money, the count room where the church keeps the money. Witnesses helped identify the man. They haven't released his name. He's on parole and is uh, held at Jackson County Jail, uh, and he's going to get larceny charges. But, uh, man, that's pretty wicked stuff, sneak into the church and steal the money, isn't it? Speaking of cars, Cheryl Freeborough's uh, 2008 Saturn Aura XE sedan is sitting right in front of this studio. It's uh, about 50% off, according to Cheryl. With uh, 40,000 miles, just over $11,000. It's, um, what do you call it, a taupe or a sand exterior? And it's the car that I'm test driving right now. But if you want to snatch it out from under me and buy it, it's a very good price. The Kelly Blue Book is 13335 And that car is only 11495 So if you want that, it's at Hyundai of Lansing. Cheryl Freeborough will have it there. And we'll talk with her later, too, about what's going on in the auto business. But right now, the publisher of www.thedetroitbureau.com. Dot com, who has been all over the world, and I uh, may be going to L.A. for the L.A. Auto Show. We're going to go out there live um, virtually a little bit later in the program. Paul Eisenstein, nice to talk to you again. Hey, it's good to be back with you. Are you heading west? Uh, yeah, I'll be heading west uh, actually sometime this afternoon. I'm out in Miami at the moment. I'm getting ready to drive the latest in a series of hybrids that carry the Lexus mark, in, in this case a CT200H. But I will be heading out to the L.A. show shortly. Miami, Los Angeles, Paris, uh, Tokyo. You, you know, you, you're, I always, you're always in a good spot. Uh, yeah, that's that's why I'm up at 5 a.m. typing copy because I gotta <laughs> I gotta get things written while I'm in between uh, in between drives. Well, we won't hold you up then. Here we uh, are seeing now that the uh, Ford Motor stock closed at seventeen dollars a share on Monday. That's up, 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 a long way since it's the highest close for Ford since uh, January 4th of 2009. Uh, we can start being believers, can we not now in the Ford Motor Company? I think there's a lot of reason to believe in Ford, but like all the auto companies, uh, not just Detroit, but really those around the world, one has to maintain a healthy dose of skepticism. You don't just mm -hmm. plunk, plunk your money down in any of these if you're planning to invest and sit back and just wait for the money to roll in. The industry is more at risk than ever before. Uh, the good news is that we are seeing, particularly from Detroit, the makers turning the sort of profits that they used to do at the absolute peak of an economic cycle. In this case, they're turning it at nearly the bottom. That's what is pretty amazing. Well, when you talk about plunking your money down, you're going to get a chance to do it this week with General Motors. The uh, CEO, Dan Ackerson, is going to ring in the bell at the New York Stock Exchange. Let's just look at that as a moment in history before we talk about the stock price. How uh, exciting, how momentous is the fact that GM will return to the big board on Thursday? No, it's very important uh, for a lot of reasons. Historically, it's significant for a company that, that went down after its 100th birthday and looked like it could have gone out of business without about uh, a $50 billion bailout. What's particularly intriguing right now is learning that there is almost five times the demand for the new GM stock as the company will actually be offering. It appears they will offer about 60 million shares additionally of their preferred stock mm -hmm. 
which could raise a couple billion dollars more for the company. And, and uh, what we're likely to see is that people will be paying significantly more for GM stock than the original $26 to $29 range that the company had been talking about. Uh, why does that matter for anybody but investors? Well, you and I have a lot of money in the company. Uh, it looked like we could have seen a loss of about $5.5 billion on the stock. Uh, but in fact, it, it, the way things are going right now, we're coming closer and closer to breaking even on this first sale. And really? with the government still holding a 40% stake, if GM's shares surge, as obviously these big investors expect, the next stock sale could turn out to be a profit. How quickly do you think the surge will happen? In other words, you usually get a bump from an IPO, don't you, on the day one. Do you think that will happen with General Motors? Well, we certainly expect to see some sort of bump immediately. It'd be un uh, unusual if it didn't surge almost immediately. Uh, but, but what happens then is so up in the air because, as you know, the stock market itself is just incredibly volatile right mm -hmm. now. Uh, have we seen uh, the peak? Uh, are we going to see a correction? Are, are people going to swallow this and have a little indigestion and maybe auto stocks slip back? I don't think so, but it is possible. Look look at Ford, which has gone up, uh, what, something like 16-fold from its absolute bottom at roughly a dollar. We have seen Tesla double since its IPO, but that IPO, we saw a bump, then we saw a fallback, and we, we've seen it now steadily rise. So... It's going to be a volatile market. It's not going to be a straight-up shot from GM. But I do believe, based on the analysts that I talk to, that we're likely to see that stock go up. Uh, so if you're sitting in a, it's it's keen for you to point out that we all have a share in General Motors. So if you're sitting in a cocktail lounge in Los Angeles and somebody says, what do you do? You can say, well, I own General Motors. That's true still, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. And I have to explain that every time to my editors uh, <laughs> at places like The Economist because I'm not allowed to own automotive stock. Oh, that's but you do by being an American at the moment, huh? Yeah, exactly. So I have to uh, I have to put that on my watch list, you know. I just have to be very, very careful. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to end up like Keith Olbermann, kicked off the uh, air for supporting uh, candidates there at MSNBC, even if it's by de facto. Um, quickly, because I know you're writing and then you're going to get on the airplane, but the Chrysler now corporations getting kudos. I don't know how much you've, you've probably seen as much product as anybody else in the new lineup. And the buzz seems to be that they're separating their brands better than before. Is that what you're hearing? Yeah. Uh, well, not just hearing, but seeing. I yeah. spent a good part of last week out in California driving the new Chrysler and Dodge vehicles. If you go to the site, you will find that we have a story talking about Chrysler's turnaround, and the Detroit Bureau.com also has a review of the new Chrysler 200, the remake of the old Sebring. There's no question that uh, they have needed to make sure that the Chrysler Dodge and Jeep and Ram brands don't duplicate one another. That was a big problem, and they're moving very quickly to separate them. You're going to see more and more differentiation. Uh, what I find particularly intriguing about what Chrysler is doing as a company, not just the brand, is that they are, believe it or not, trying to mimic Hyundai in their turnaround. Mm -hmm. They are basically looking at a company that went through the same problems as they did, starting with huge quality reputational issues mm -hmm. and also with, a, with a, a brand that didn't have much perceived value and has turned itself around into one of the fastest growing brands in the United States. Well, that's exactly what Chrysler and its various brands hope to do. How long do you think it will take for people to equate Chrysler with quality? Well, it will, they will hope to see some change in perceptions coming year. One of the most intriguing things about what Chrysler is doing is putting a focus on getting the interiors improved. That was an area where Chrysler just really, admittedly, stank. Mm -hmm. Their interiors were weak. They didn't look good. They used cheap materials. Uh, they, they had apparent fit and finish issues, all sorts of problems. And if you look at the new models, they've gone to an entirely new type of interior. The gauges look good. The materials look better. Uh, example, uh, instead of having multi-part instrument panels, they have now one-piece instrument panels. So you don't have all these pieces that come together that may not fit right. And even if they do fit right, look like they're not constructed well. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the, the first steps. But perceived quality has to be matched by what they call build quality and long-term reliability. 
that's going to take several years till the J.D. Power surveys and the Consumer Report surveys start to echo that the models built in 2011 and beyond actually are as good as Chrysler is claiming they will be. So if you were writing for Newsweek magazine in the front where they have the arrows going up and down in the conventional wisdom section, could you put an up red arrow next to all three of the American Big Three? Right now, definitely I could. Uh, Chrysler would probably be the one that would get me to waver a little bit, but after seeing their 11 models, I'm now ready to give an up arrow for all three of the Detroit makers. What's particularly interesting is, uh, while I don't think that the, the new 200 is absolutely best in class, it is now possible for people to go into the compact car segment, long dominated by the Japanese, and with the certainly with the Ford Focus and the new Chevrolet Cruze, to say, I'd rather buy Detroit than I would Japanese. Wow, you made us all feel great this morning. Thank you very much for that. It's good to be with you. Travel safely, and we'll find you at uh, the DetroitBureau.com. Paul Eisenstein, man of mystery all around the world in the auto business, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks again. Very much Thanks appreciate much, it. Roger. You bet. Uh, 33 minutes after the hour. Isn't that great to hear? We're going to talk to more automotive experts this morning, too. Uh, people like Scott Komar, the general manager and vice president of the Harold Ziegler Automotive Group, will be with us. Cheryl Freeborough from Hyundai of Lansing will be along as well. And then we'll go live to Los Angeles. John Fitzpatrick is the product manager for the Chevrolet Camaro convertible. That sounds pretty good, too. And Doyle will be here, too, who was one of the top communications people in Ford Motor Company. So lots of automotive news this morning. Why is it important to you? Jobs. That's what it means here in Michigan. Jobs and sales and the fact that uh, the American automotive companies, all three, which uh, about two years ago could have gone under. They talked about being too big to fail. So have they right-sized? Have they improved? And are they coming back? Those are the questions we're asking this morning at 33 minutes after. Did you watch Monday Night Football last night? I know Amanda stayed up watching Monday Night Football because she just loves sports. But maybe she didn't. But Tony Cuthbert certainly did. It looked like an Xbox Madden game. I swear to you. It was 28 to nothing. Eagles over the Redskins before the first quarter was over. And then very quickly, 35 to nothing. And then the Redskins came back. You have to understand, this is Michael Vick who's playing for the Eagles. He had four touchdown passes, including an 88-yarder on the very first play. That only happens on Xbox, doesn't it? 35 to nothing, and then Washington came back. Donovan McNabb was uh, picked three times. Remember now, he used to play for the Eagles. Now he plays for the Redskins. And just yesterday, the Redskins announced a new contract with Donovan McNabb. How about this? Five years, $78 million, $40 million guaranteed, and he's 34 years old. And don't remember, it's just a couple weeks ago, he was benched at the very end of the game playing against the Lions. Interesting. Fireworks yesterday. And to think, we had a game against Buffalo this weekend that was, what, 14 to 12? And yesterday it was 59 to 28. Eagles over the Redskins on Monday Night Football. 35 after the hour. The Answer Man is next. Turn up your television and radio. You're going to get the answers to all your questions. It's Michael Patrick Shields on Tuesday. And if you're listening on any of the radio stations across the state of Michigan, that's Mount Pleasant, Petoskey, Traverse City, Hastings, Lansing, Saginaw, Manistee, Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo, Ludington, Muskegon, and lots of cities in between. Maybe you know it's time for The Answer Man. Based on that music you hear, it sounds kind of mystical, that music you hear. You Check the rhythm of this thing right here. All right. So a lot of these uh, soothsayers, the answer men, come from the East. They get their wisdom from the East. But as I put on the answer man hat now, which you can see if you're watching on Fox 47, or you can catch us online on YouTube, and you can connect to all of it through michigantalknetwork.com, by the way. Um, uh, If you see, I'm wearing a very special hat of wisdom, but my wisdom doesn't always come from the East. Sometimes it has to come from part south, if you know what I mean. And the people say, ah, that uh, Michael Patrick Shields, he's got an answer for everything. And so I became the answer man, or the son of answer man. And Gary Austin will often query me with questions, which he is just about to do right now. But before we get the questions from Gary Austin, Hmm. I have living proof that I am an answer man. Would you like to know what it is? Uh, I can't wait. Let me take you back to November 4th, a conversation that I had 
with John Truscott from the Truscott Group. He was Governor Engler's uh, uh, spokesperson. He ran the DeVos campaign. He ran the Hoekstra campaign. And a well-known PR lobbyist type from around the state of Michigan. Here was the conversation. Mind you, today is November 16th. This was on November 4th. The gossip uh, that we heard yesterday is that Dennis Muchmore uh, may be the chief of staff for governor-elect and then Governor Rick Snyder. Have you heard that? Uh, I have heard Dennis's name. Uh, Governor Alex Snyder couldn't find anybody better than Dennis Muchmore. He's a wonderful person. He's been around. He's held numerous different positions, and he's just one smart guy. And, and he's the type of guy that Republican or Democrat, everybody around town loves him. Um, he's just he's one of the best. And I, I really hope for the administration and for the state that it's, uh, that it's Dennis. So about a week after that interview, I ran into Dennis much more at a tailgate party, Gary, at the uh, Michigan State University football game uh, against Minnesota. He and his wife, Deb, were there. And I said, how about it? You know, uh, is there a chance you're going to be chief of staff? And he says, well, I haven't really heard from them. I mean, I've heard my name bandied about, but I haven't heard from anyone. And that's usually a sign they're going to go with someone else. But yesterday, Michigan's governor-elect Rick Snyder chose... Lansing lobbyist, Dennis Muchmore, to Very serve good. as his chief of staff. Answer man proof once again, you are blessed with a special talent. I so, uh, also read mirrorsnews.com, <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> that that which helps. That helps. Uh, he's 63 years old, and he's uh, not been on the government payroll in decades and was a partner in a top lobbying Lansing firm till he retired about five years ago. He's uh, going to come back out and be the chief of staff. We want to say, too, congratulations to Geraldine Losher who we've known for a long, long time because uh, she used to work in the Governor Engler administration, and she is going to be the new communications chief for mm -hmm. Governor Snyder. And I know she listens to the program. She's been very nice to us. And it'll be nice to have some of these familiar faces from the, uh, from the Engler administration now in the Snyder administration. He certainly did reach out to people who know what they're doing, didn't he, Gary? Well, he sure did. Um, and, and the whole objective here is to try to work as many folks who have inside knowledge of what's happening down there close to him because he, he's got a lot to learn here. And he knows that. He's the first to admit it. And uh, he certainly is going about it in such a way where he's really working those. I mean, I mean those who've yeah. had those long careers, for example, with the Engler administration. I mean, these are people in the know. So I got a, a Facebook late last night message from uh, Dennis Muchmore who said, this is amazing stuff. And so off we go. Very good. Now, uh, your turn. You've got yes. two minutes and 22 seconds to try to stump the answer, man. It's never, mm. ever, ever been done. So good luck to you. I'm going to do my darndest. Here we go. Number one, big banks will face a number of questions this week on Capitol Hill. Answer, man, what will the focus be of these questions? The focus is going to be money. It is. And the foreclosure mess. It's set for today, and the House is going to take this up on Thursday. The Senate opens hearings today on that. Okay. Members of the new Senate will pick their leaders today for the next Congress. Now, this is the, there's a certain number out of all the Congresses that have been meeting here since day one. This is number what? 112. Very good. I thought I would stump the answer, man. No. Shame on me. You're and by right. the way, uh, yes. Nevada Democrat Harry Reid is expected to remain the Senate Majority Leader, and Kentucky Republican Mitch McConnell should easily remain the Senate Minority Leader, in case you're wondering. Once again, the answer man telling us more information than we really needed to know. <laughs> Showing once again. Oh, no, you need to know that stuff. That's true. No, I mean, really. I mean, look, if you tell really us, matter. if you tell us, we need to know. We'll leave Thank it at that. The project known as the fix on I-196 through Done. what? Yeah, you're right. Through what? Very big city. Grand Rapids. Yes. Highway rebuilt. Two miles of that. More lanes in each direction. It's wider. Five new bridges to boot. All that done on budget. And on what? On time. You're absolutely right. I think it's even a touch early, if I'm not mistaken. I tell you what, that, that's, that's terrific. Hey, General Motors, the yeah. initial public stock offering, those mm -hmm. who have a little extra money set aside for this, mm -hmm. will be anxious to know that the... Um, that the price per share is going to top how much per share? Well, they thought it was going to be between 26 and $28, but yes. there was some talk from Paul Eisenstein from the carconnection.com a little earlier this morning on the program. He said it maybe, probably will be higher. Hmm. MPS, proving once again, you know everything, and a little bit, and a touch more. You're right, $30 per share. Sources close to this say, what country, what country's motor, motor corp could take at least 1% stake? in GM as a part of this IPO. Which country? A foreign country. You're right. China. 
Yes. Perfect again. That's the way to go. Thank you very much. He is Gary Austin. I am Michael Patrick Shields, the answer man. And we'll be back with some news about rewards cards, those little things you use in stores. Something you may want to know about. Stay tuned for that. Nine minutes before the hour, Michael Patrick Shields breaking news this morning. Of course, that's Paul McCartney. Sir Paul McCartney, he's royalty of his own in uh, England and London, around the world, really. But Nikki Hale, our world correspondent, is with us for breaking news this morning. Good morning, Nikki. Good morning, Michael. Prince William is engaged to uh, his longtime girlfriend, Kate Middleton, a spokesman for the monarchy, announced just a few minutes ago while the rest of the world was sleeping, the two are going to have a royal wedding. What's your immediate reaction? Well, we kind of knew that was coming, I think, but uh, wonderful news they finally announced it so we can all prepare. (laughs) Yeah, uh, they're going to marry in the spring or summer of 2011, so it's next summer already. There's a statement from Clarence House. That's the prince's official residence. And everybody loves the pomp and circumstance, do they not, of a royal wedding. Yeah, I think it will remain to be seen how much money they actually spend with the economic uh, situation and knowing that the queen is uh, trying to cut back on everything she's doing. We'll see how fancy this actually turns out to be, huh? Oh, that's a good question. Now, how do you find the line between rallying the people behind the future king of England with an event they'll all remember and getting over the line where they say, hmm, do they really need to be that extravagant? Right. Maybe they'll make it really big and fancy, and they'll have lots of really fancy guests. Maybe they'll go green, you know, recyclable or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think that uh, Kate Middleton's going to be wearing a, uh, a burlap sack uh, made of hemp or anything like that, and this, this is going to be something else. Now, the prince is second in line to the throne, and uh, he proposed during an October vacation in Kenya, but they kept it a secret until now. I, I have no idea why. Uh, after they're married, they're going to live in North Wales, where uh, Prince William is currently serving with the Royal Air Force. They are both 28 years old. They met eight years ago when they were students at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Now, that's a, quite a courtship, eight years, huh? Yeah, but that's, I think that's a nice thing for them to have a long relationship that is not, uh, you know, just... Hi, we met. We're getting married. I think it's a good thing they know each other. She's quite familiar with the royal family, so she should have a easier time fitting in, I suppose. Kate's parents, Michael and Carol Middleton, went to Balmoral. That's the 50,000-acre uh, estate in Scotland uh, owned by the royal family. They had a weekend of shooting with Prince William, and uh, that's all with the Queen's approval. That must have been some f- amazingly funny edition of Meet the Parents, wouldn't you say? Yes, uh, very different from what any of us would expect to go to, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a long time since we've had this uh, high profile of a royal wedding. The prince is second in line to the throne. Some people say maybe Prince Charles will never be king of England, that it'll be Prince William when he's ready, because after all, Queen Elizabeth's still going strong and has no indication that she is going to abdicate the throne to, to Prince Charles. But this is, uh, is it not what... Uh, the Brits do best, this sort of pomp and circumstance, isn't it? Oh, they love it, absolutely. This will really rally the country to get together and uh, be behind them. This will be the event of the year next year. Thank goodness it's not the Olympics next year, because I would have been a close runner. <laughs> oh, that's a very, very good point. What do you remember about the, uh, the uh, wedding of Princess Diana and Prince Charles? I remember being glued to the television. I mean, yeah. just absolutely couldn't move, watched it, the whole thing, just beautiful. Everybody was just... Cheering. It was a very happy time, and I think it's going to be the same thing. You know, people are going to be really, really, really pleased with what they see, I think. Well, here we go again. Nikki Hale, world correspondent, Prince William and Kate Middleton are officially engaged. There are women now all across the world with their hearts broken. That's true, too, isn't it? That is so true. And I'll let you know when my invitation arrives in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> Keep your eyes open for that royal invitation with the seal, Nikki Hale, the world correspondent. I wonder if Kate Middleton, before she gets married, might want to go to Stephen L. Marvin's Salon and Wellness Spa in uh, Holtz. You can pamper your loved ones this holiday season with a Stephen L. Marvin gift certificate and holiday gift sets from Aveda. Call Stephen L. Marvin today at uh, 694-7788. That's in the 517 area code if you happen to be in the state capital. It's 517-694-7788 or visit them at 1958 Cedar in Holtz.
Uh, it is uh, five minutes now before the hour. Michael Patrick Shields heard all across the state of Michigan. Do you get people who ask you about rewards cards? Does that start to annoy you? I have to confess it does annoy me. You go into the gas station. You just want to make a quick transaction. Do you have a gas station reward card? No. Would you like one? No, thank you. And it takes, you know, another 15 seconds, 20 seconds. And it happens everywhere. It's in the drugstores and the gas stations. And, you know, I really, I got enough to keep track of without keeping track of my points at a, at a drugstore or a gas station, you know. And then they'll say very often, well, you can get one coffee free when you buy 15 of them. You know, I, you know it keeps tracks on the reward. I just, I don't have time. I, I really I appreciate the free coffee and all that, and I know that they want you to have the rewards card so that you'll come back there more often, but I don't know. If you're like me, maybe you like them, and maybe they work for you, the rewards cards. 888-900-9966 is the number to call, 888-900-9966. But the thing is, if I go to the same, let's say, convenience store or gas station all the time, and they ask me every single time, you know, you'd think they'd get to know by now that I don't have one and I don't want one. When, am I, am I, I don't want you to complain, but, you know, just wondering what you feel about that. 888-900-9966, rewards cards. It's Michael Patrick Shields. Grocery stores have them, too, don't they? We're back right after the news. Stay with us. We'll be working on your next story, and we'll reveal it when we get back. Very pleasant Tuesday to you. It's Michael Patrick Shields. We have a listening experience for you this morning. Lots of information, lots of fun, and uh, some entertainment, too. First of all, you're probably wondering, what happened yesterday on uh, the first day of hunting? Well, it was 50 degrees and sunny in parts of the state. It couldn't have been nicer for deer hunting, but state wildlife officials are saying that it appears fewer hunters than normal turned out for hunting yesterday. We're not exactly sure why, but the question sort of begs itself Maybe they should standardize the start of hunting season to a Saturday morning or a Friday morning or a Sunday morning. So having it on a Monday morning seems a little, well, silly to me because if you're going to go up north and get all set and play cards and all that stuff, you're going to spend the whole week. And then Monday morning, a lot of people have to go back to work. So the question that I have is why not just put it on Saturday morning at first light, you know, pick a week that makes sense. And do that every year. That way, you'd be guaranteed at least a weekend for some people. And I know some of them go up to their lodges and hotels and all that for longer than that. But it seems like Saturday morning would make sense. If you're a hunter or anybody in the business who knows anything about this, I'd like to find out why it has to move around like that. 888-900-9966 is the number to call. That's 888-900-9966. Now, we're going to talk about the auto business this morning. And by the way... In a somewhat related story, yesterday the Dow was up nine points, S&P lost a point, and the NASDAQ closed down four. But the outgoing White House economic advisor, Larry Summers, he says the U.S. economy is doing well compared to the rest of the world, but it should start exporting more. That's uh, his idea about uh, the United States economy. And when he says doing better than the rest of the world, I, I was talking to one of my friends in Ireland yesterday, and I said, I'm probably going to come out and see you on St. Patrick's Day. We're going to do the show from Ireland for St. Patrick's Day. And he says, that's if they don't sell off Ireland and attach it to a tugboat and pull it away. <laughs> he said that that country, which was once known as the Celtic Tiger, is in serious economic trouble. It's uh, 10 minutes after the hour. They're on the Euro there in Ireland. Let's talk about the automotive business here. We have a couple of super dealers with us. One of them is Scott Comar, the general manager and vice president of the Harold Ziegler Automotive Group in Grand Rapids. Good morning to you. Good morning, Michael Patrick. And we're also with Cheryl Freeborough from Hyundai of Lansing, uh, formerly owned two Saturn dealerships yes. here in the state capital area. How are you? Good. Good morning, Michael Patrick. The lady in red. You look yes. fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Do you know Scott Comar? Have you met before? I don't, we've probably seen each other at different events, but I don't I Dealer don't events so. and things yes. like that? Yeah. Um, the reason it's interesting uh, to, is that earlier this morning we talked to Paul Eisenstein from thecarconnection.com. Mm -hmm. Now, he's, as you probably both know, one of the most respected automotive uh, analysts, journalists in the world. He's mm -hmm. everywhere. He's driven everything. He's talked to every executive. And he's nice enough to talk with us. So um, he mentioned Chrysler and Hyundai in the same breath. Wow. And I'll let you hear a little bit about 
what Paul Eisenstein said to us earlier this morning about the auto business. Here it is. I spent yeah. a good part of last week out in California driving the new Chrysler and Dodge vehicles. If you go to the site, you will find that we have a story talking about Chrysler's turnaround, and the Detroit Bureau.com also has a review of the new Chrysler 200, the remake of the old Sebring. There's no question that uh, they have needed to make sure that the Chrysler Dodge and Jeep and Ram brands don't duplicate one another. That was a big problem, and they're moving very quickly to separate them. You're going to see more and more differentiation. Uh, what I find particularly intriguing about what Chrysler is doing as a company, not just the brand, is that they are, believe it or not, trying to mimic Hyundai in their turnaround. Mm -hmm. They are basically looking at a company that went through the same problems as they did, starting with huge quality reputational issues mm -hmm. and also with, a, with a, a brand that didn't have much perceived value and has turned itself around into one of the fastest growing brands in the United States. Well, that's exactly what Chrysler and its various brands hope to do. Scott Komar, general manager of the uh, Harold Ziegler Automotive Group, what's your reaction to that? Well, I've got a lot of friends that uh, have been with Hyundai over that period of time, and, and Hyundai is a is a good company to mimic. They've uh, if they were a, a fairly unknown company. They did deal with with uh, having to grow their reputation, and they've done a very nice job with it. And what we're seeing coming out of the gates with that that new great, uh, Jeep Grand Cherokee is really the first one to come out. We've got I, mean, I think I've got 65 of those in stock right now, and and they are we sell five to ten of them it seems pretty consistently um every day uh, it's, it's a great product everything that we've got coming that we saw down in orlando a while ago uh we're very excited about so um i think chrysler's definitely on the right track and hyundai if, if that's the road we're going to follow they've, they've done a very nice job cheryl fibro hyundai yeah, Atlantic. I, I think you know that the, the, the chrysler products have always been really good pro popular products they've always had the best vans and all those things. And I think the article in the Detroit News over yesterday really said it. I, I like the fact that they're going to differentiate. Differenti they're not going to have two of the vans in the same showroom. Yeah, two it's funny that you thing. bring that up and because I think uh, that's so important. 2,300 U.S. dealers of Chrysler, 85% are selling Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram in the same showroom. And see, that's I think that's one of GM's big mistakes is having the same cars in in the same showroom then how, you're competing with yourself i mm -hmm. think that was one reason saturn was so successful is because we were so different the yeah. product was different even the way of selling the car was different and we didn't have any duplicate product and i really like that part of the article that i read in the Detroit news about the fact that they're going to differentiate the product you're not going to see two of the same cars next to each other scott according to uh, one analyst it was chrysler and dodge that needed the most differentiation you agree Oh, absolutely. And Jeep, Jeep is an iconic brand. Mm -hmm. There really wasn't anything sitting in the uh, uh, Jeep showroom that was a duplication um, of, of too much. The Patriot and the Compass were pretty close to one another, but you really didn't have that in the Chrysler Dodge lineup. But, mm -hmm. you know, over time they had Chrysler dealers standing out there on their own, and, and uh, then they had Dodge dealers out there. And when the minivan came out and, you know, Chrysler selling the heck out of out of a minivan, then the Dodge dealers want a minivan, or uh, you know, it, so there there was some of that was because of how dealers over the last however many years had separated themselves. But now that they're pulling back under one roof, it, it absolutely makes no sense to duplicate these brands. When you say the name Chrysler, first of all, what do you think, and what should people think? Well, where they want Chrysler to be is seen as a luxury nameplate. They really want to get that one up to where it competes. Uh, back up with the, with the Cadillacs and the Lincolns and the you know now all the high end imports and you start to see a lot of that when that new Chrysler 300 comes out. Uh, they kind of got into that when they made it years ago, uh, but now uh, where they're where they're looking to launch that product uh, in the spring when that car comes out, it's definitely back up into that that uh, domestic luxury nameplate. When was the last time that the Chrysler nameplate ha had a truly luxury vehicle that could compete with Cadillac? You know, I, I think the probably the last one that came closest was the the 300 when it was redesigned mm -hmm. uh, about five years ago or so. But uh, I, it, it, that uh, kind of found its own little niche. I mean, that became the car of hip hop artists, and it came, became the <laughs> car of uh, executives. And you know, you saw it all over on TV with in TV programs. But uh, you know, they they haven't had one that really 
maintain competing in that high-end luxury, and that's where they need to be. Once upon a time, I had a Dodge Shadow convertible, if you can believe that. I <laughs> squeezed myself into that thing. But when you say the name Dodge, what do people think, and what should they think? Well, the Dodge brand, uh, is they're trying to separate that out so that it will be the sport, uh, the sporty side of things. That's where, you know, you hear Dodge and you think of the Viper, you think of the Challenger, the Charger, um, and where they're taking that car, that, that line is to make that a very uh, sporty, uh, sporty brand. You know, it's uh, interesting, Cheryl, that you say uh, that the Chrysler always had cars that turn people's heads because mm -hmm. Scott Burgess is saying in the Detroit News this morning that uh, Chrysler has never had a problem with design. Some of the most stunning vehicles on the road today, the problem has always been with execution. The interiors have been sort of cheap. They use hard plastic uh, that, that he says is like Walmart furniture. That's mm -hmm. changing, too, now, Scott, yeah, isn't I think it? That, well, I think that's real. You can tell a, a Chrysler product when it goes down the street. It's distinguished from other products. I mm -hmm. think that's really true. And I think it, when, when he was talking about um, the luxury side of it, that's what Hyundai is trying to do as well, is push themselves up to being looked at as a luxury vehicle. You know, they've got the new Equus and stuff like that, and Chrysler doing it. It's a challenge to do that, to change your, your vision. Well, uh, Scott, you'll be happy to know that the headline in the Detroit News this morning is Chrysler's 2011, 2011 lineup excels from the inside out. Well, every meeting that we were at from 17, 18 months ago, is, and even prior to that, when Jim Press was there before Fiat mm -hmm. got involved, they said that. The, the first cars that they started looking at, the interiors were, were really the big issue, mm -hmm. and they started changing that, and Fiat has been able to really uh, excel that. And, you know, you stop and think about it's really only been 17 months since Fiat uh, has been, been involved, and they've changed this entire lineup from the inside out. The interiors are fantastic in these cars we're seeing. Scott Comar, the general manager and vice president of the Harold Ziegler Automotive Group in Grand Rapids. Thanks. Good to connect with you again. What are you driving to work this morning? You know, I've got a uh, Jeep Wrangler I've been driving, uh, and uh, we're taking that up. Matter of fact, deer hunting tomorrow. So. <laughs> oh, good. Uh, See, he's we'll, going to we'll get, get out, out there, there and add the, the uh, statistics. Good hunting to you, Scott Comar. At 18 after the hour, we'll continue with Cheryl Freeborough from Hyundai of Lansing. Lots of automotive news this morning. It's important to you because it could translate into jobs. And we could save you some money, too. 18 minutes after the hour, we're back in a flash. It's Michael Patrick Shields. The automotive business is uh, dominating the news here in Michigan this morning, as it often does. A former government official says he expects the price for General Motors' initial public offering to be higher than the announced $26 to $29 range. It's Stephen Ratner. Remember him? He was the top guy for the U.S. government's automobile task force. And he was in Detroit on Monday. He told uh, people at the press event there that there is a greater level of confidence in car makers and in their ability to perform because of profit numbers. Six uh, General Motors executives say the reception they have received from investors is substantial enough to sell the shares now for more than $30 instead of under $30. So that is Thursday uh, when... Uh, the uh, chairman of General Motors will ring the bell on Wall Street there in New York. It'll be a historic moment to be sure. Dan Ackerson, the CEO at 9 in the morning at the New York Stock Exchange, will herald the return of General Motors after 17 months of absence from uh, the stock market because of bankruptcy protection. The stock will be traded under the familiar GM stock symbol. And uh, just think of it, GM stock was once the most traded in the world between 1917 and 1962. And uh, after a brief absence, it will be back. The decision for you will be, should you buy it or should you not? And uh, you're going to have to talk to your broker about that one. But uh, the fact of the matter is, everybody that I've talked to so far says you can expect usually a bump on the day of an initial public offering because there's a lot of excitement and uh, so... Are you willing to take that chance? Are you in it for the long haul? I mean, after all, you do own some General Motors anyway just by being an American. <laughs> a, a, a certain percentage of it. Cheryl Freeborough is with us from Hyundai of Lansing. She owned a couple of Saturn dealerships for a long, long time and now has remade her dealership not only into a Hyundai dealership in Grand Ledge, but also pre-owned certified vehicles right. of every variety, including Saturns for people who still, you know, long for the good old days. Still love the Saturns, you know, just like Oldsmobile. People still love their Oldsmobiles. We get that all the time, and Saturn's the same way. There's one right out front here, the Saturn Aura XE Sedan 2008, and uh, this car's for sale. This is a pre-owned vehicle. Uh, what color is that? Is that a sand color or taupe? Kind of 
of a uh, taupey gold color. Yeah, it's yeah, more sophisticated than just gold, though. It's yes. a very subtle yeah. kind of car. Yeah. They were really, you know, the car makers, even been, well, even when that one was built, were picky about making sure the colors were re really unique. They have to be a particular kind oh. because of the paint, but they want them to be a unique color, too, something hmm. that stands out. They do a lot of focus groups on color. Yeah. Um, to pick out which colors are the, fa the, the most favorite. So. I'd say it's elegant. That's uh, $11,000, yes. just over $11,000. It's a 2008 yeah. uh, with uh, 40,000 miles on it, and it's got all the bells and whistles that mm -hmm. you would want. And uh, the point of the matter is that's about half off it and is. below the blue book price. Below the blue book. Ours, we usually try to price everything below blue book because we want to be competitive, obviously. Mm -hmm. We want to sell good cars, but you want to sell cars. So we try to find the most competitive way to doing that, and that's to watch blue book and see what uh, what cars are going for. Used cars are going high right now. Are they? It, yeah. In fact, I'm Then how can you sell it before the below the blue book value? Because we bought it for the right price. It was maybe a trade-in. Um, maybe we bought, we bought it. We buy them sometimes expecting to do a certain amount of reconditioning. It probably needed less than we... we Oh, I see. Needed. You know, we try to give ourselves a margin for reconditioning. Um, I always did between two and three thousand dollars, believe it or not, years ago. Hmm. Um, but you try to give yourself that margin so that you can put that into it and still be at the right price. Would you buy General Motors stock on day one? No, you wouldn't. I think, so. I think Ca cautious. I guess I'm cautious. I guess I'm still not seeing. Um, I, I think there's there's still a lot to be cautious about. Um, I'm not sure, and, and maybe it's just my feeling because I've been through so much, but um, I'm sure there are going to be a lot of people very excited about buying it the first day, and mm -hmm. I heard the 32 was going to be the starting. It could probably go up if it's very popular. And how many years were you in the General Motors system? Almost 30 years. 30 years. Almost 30 years. And you worked so. in uh, Cadillac and also Saturn? Sa Saturn, uh, Chevrolet. 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 Mm -hmm. um, Ford stock. Uh, doing very well, up to seventeen dollars now, and uh, they have a lot of product momentum, is what mm -hmm. it's called. Uh, the you know the spotlights on GM this week, but right. Ford's having a rally, closing at seventeen dollars Monday. That's up four point two nine percent. Climbed as high as seventeen dollars and forty one cents a share during the day. That's the highest close for Ford since January four two thousand nine. But they really didn't have the dip that um, GM and Chrysler did. You know that they didn't have the bankruptcy issues that they did. So I think. Their the momentum is just it can, has, hasn't gone back back and forth like GM's has. Do you know if you um, bought Ford stock on New Year's Day, well, the day after New mm -hmm. Year's Day last year, and you looked at it now, take a guess what percentage up it is this year. Is it up 10%? 70. 70%? Isn't that amazing? Oh, my God. Yeah, they had a 39% jump wow. since October. Wow. See, they've been The Ford Motor Company. That's, that's doing business the right way. That's you great. sell Ford products, too? We sell four products. Mm -hmm. we sell, yeah, we try to have a mix of everything because everybody wants something different. So definitely. That's what a used car lot's supposed to be. You know, all new car stores have used car store lots. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we started at Saturn, nobody even thought about used cars in Saturn. It took quite a while before we started developing a used car lot. But um, all, all, all stores have a used car lot. And what you want to look for is a place that... Um, that has the best ones for you, that recondition them, conditions them right. And they should mm -hmm. be able to show you the history of how it's been taken care of. They should be able to show you, you know, the, the Carfax on it to make sure it's not been damaged during an accident. Those are the things to look out for. Yes. Because when you say used car, sometimes mm -hmm. people say, oh, boy, used mm -hmm. car. But pre-owned, pre -owned certified is, is right. what you're Certi saying. Certified or pre-owned. But you want to uh, uh, you want to say how, you know, can you show me what you've done to, to make this car better? You know, let, let me see what the reconditioning was. And that's what reconditioning is. Reconditioning isn't de isn't washing and, and vacuuming the inside. Oh. Reconditioning means checking the whole engine out, um, looking and making sure that everything's functioning, the brakes, the tires are in good shape. Um, and you do all that? We do all that. Yeah, about 150 different points. I'll have to bring in a list one time and show you. Hey, um, if you have a pre-owned vehicle or a vehicle that you maybe bought new mm -hmm. that has, I don't know, let's say 70,000 miles on it, mm -hmm. can you bring it in? For a physical, a yes, checkup? You That's ex absolutely. You know, you just said the right word. It's a physical. Yeah, There is a cost to that mm -hmm. because you've got to pay a technician, obviously, yeah. to do it. But you can but get someone to do that? Absolutely. You can have a physical on the vehicle. And that's, and you should do. But, but a good dealer, every time you have your oil change, should be looking, 
by the mileage in doing the, the physical for you. So there's a little bit of that so anyway with the oil little, changes. There should be. If you take it, that's why it's important to take it to a dealer, I think, that, you know, because the dealer has the expertise to know what to look for. But and most of us, or a lot of us, go to the quick oil change because right. we're in a hurry. We don't even have to get out of the car. Is that a mistake? Um, I don't think it's so much a mistake. You just want to make sure that if they are uh, telling you to fix something, oh. that, that it really sometimes the cheap oil changes are a means of them selling other products. Yes, every, every single time. Every single time. How about so, wiper blades? Yeah, How about yeah. a filter? You so know, you, I don't know. You they show me that sure. filter with the black stuff in it and say, yeah. "Oh my gosh, look at your filter." I don't know. That could be normal. Yeah, well, yeah, it probably isn't with all the black stuff in it. But if they show you the filter and it's black, you probably need a filter. Uh, so, But that's but, their means of know, selling other products. If you stop it's at a tough. different oil change place all the time, you don't know who you're dealing no, with. You what can they determine you in don't. seven minutes? You don't, you know. So reputation, um, referral, you know, if you know somebody that's gone someplace and been thrilled with them, then that's maybe the place to go. So. Um, the uh, Los Angeles Auto Show is going on this week. We're going to talk uh, yeah. later in the program live uh, with John Fitzpatrick. He's the product manager for the Chevy Camaro mm. convertible. He's in Smell A or LA, if you want to call it like heard. that. Is but, it? Yeah, and this is the beginning of the auto show season. This is um, the California is kind of the start. You know, Detroit has theirs in, in January. So this is the start of that season. This is when everybody starts almost, I hate to say this, stops buying cars and starts watching what's coming out. Is that so what they happens? they can make a decision. Some people wait for an auto show to shop because you can go and see every make and model at the auto show. You can sit in it, you can feel it, and they wait to do that mm -hmm. to make their decision on their next car they're going to purchase. Hmm. Unless they're buying pre-owned and then... Unless they're buying pre-owned, then they're going to, they should be shopping either online or, or going or walking around the lots. Do people get, still give cars as Christmas presents? Oh, Yes. Do they yeah, put a big really bow fun. on top and Birthday all that stuff? Birthday presents and Christmas presents. We always have huge, big red bows to put on the cars and, and make it special. But, uh, yeah, they do that. They do that. It's Hyundai of Lansing. Uh, Cheryl Freeborough, one of our automotive experts, and we're very happy to have you here this morning on our Fox 47 Thank television you. broadcast and syndicated all across the state. People can buy cars from Cheryl no matter where you are uh, in Michigan. It's Hyundai of Lansing and the web address. It's HyundaiBlancing.com. Simple Very as that. Easy. And you can get the car I'm driving right out from mm -hmm. under me. I've had it for about a week now. It's 50% off the Saturn Aura, and it's $11,000, 2008, mm -hmm. 40,000 miles. And believe me, they will come and take it the second you want it. <laughs> You've lost the car before, haven't you? <laughs> Thank you very much, Cheryl Freeborough. By the way, this is a Grand Traverse Tuesday brought to you by Grand Traverse Pie Company. Mike Busley, good story for Michigan, is going to Good Morning America tomorrow, and he's going to be featured in a Thanksgiving feature. So we'll talk with him about whether he's nervous about going to the network tomorrow. Uh, very shortly. Remember, you can find us at michigantalknetwork.com. That's where you can connect with us on Facebook and YouTube and Twitter, too, if you want. It's michigantalknetwork.com. And tomorrow night from 5 until 8 at the office of Dr. Christine Teneglia, my wife at Okemos and Bennett Road in the Okemos area, if you happen to be here, we're going to kick off my new book, Invite Yourself to the Party, with uh, live music and hors d'oeuvres and champagne and wines. It's all free anytime between 5 and 8. Pop on out and see us. In fact, Cheryl, Phil Denny will be there playing the saxophone, yeah, and I know the ladies will be swooning over yes, that one. Will. So come and see us tomorrow. There'll be lots of interesting people. It's a great guest list of RSVPs I've seen so far. 5 till 8 tomorrow night, the dental office of Dr. Christine Teneglia. Don't worry, there will be no filling or drilling or anything like that. <laughs> just some champagne and live music and fun and my new book invite yourself to the party see you there tomorrow well maybe you have a hungry heart and maybe you're just hungry this morning it's a grand traverse tuesday brought to you by grand traverse pie company and uh, believe it or not mike busley who founded the company a michigan resident as i understand is going to make a very special trip uh tomorrow to New York City. Mike Busley, where will you be going and what will you be doing? Well, uh, good morning, Michael Patrick. Actually, I'm, I'm in uh, Midtown as we speak. I just got here last night. And, Fantastic. Uh, we're going to be delivering some pies today to the f good folks at Good Morning America for a feature on Thursday morning, hopefully. Oh, you're doing that this morning. You're going to go over to Good Morning America. Now, um, how, how, what's your, uh, how, how is it that you end up uh, going over to ABC? <laughs> well, they, uh, they were, they, I'm not sure. I'll find out more today when I actually meet the folks. But mm -hmm. 
they something caused them to order some of our pies online, and oh. we shipped them out to them. Mm-hmm. They did they did an evaluation, and they notified us late last week that they have a segment coming on this Thursday, kind of a holiday segment, and they wanted to include our pecan and pumpkin pie. Could we could we do that? And uh, the answer was obviously sure. We will do that. So out of all the pies and all the gin joints and all the towns and all the world, they called you. They walked into ours. Yes. Yeah. Um, now, yeah, it, we, and we feel very fortunate. I'll, I'll actually meet the folks again today and kind of learn a little bit more about it. I'd, I'd like to know them and, and know how they found us, and and uh, you know we we feel honored. So uh, we we feel pretty good about our pumpkin and pecan pies, and we're sure happy that they do too. Now, do they uh, do they fly you out there for that and put you up and all that business too? And will you appear on the TV show? I, I won't appear. Okay, just... I might not even be there for that, uh-huh. um, but. I'm going to be here. I, I came out on my own. We oh, did okay. this on our own. Mm-hmm. We just wanted to make sure what the pies we shipped arrived, and and uh, uh, you know everything goes smoothly. This you know this opportunity doesn't come along often, so we just didn't want any any glitches. So I came out, and actually, I'm going to be baking another uh, one of our big pies. You'll see them on our website from time to time mm-hmm. at one of Mario Batali's restaurants tomorrow. No uh, kidding. One of our large pies, and taking that over to the staff is just kind of a a thank you token of appreciation. Uh, so uh, we shipped our big pie pan and all the goodies for that. So I'm actually going to, uh, Mario's, a, Mario's a, uh, an acquaintance, and he was very uh, gracious in letting us use one of his ovens in one of his kitchens down in uh, Greenwich Village. So I'll be baking a pie in, in uh, Otto restaurant here tomorrow. Well, of course, uh, with uh, Mario Batali and his family having a summer home in um, in the Traverse City area, let's say, up that way, Lelano Peninsula, that's where you would have gotten to know him, I'm guessing, right? Yeah, he before he bought his place, he would come up for summers, and he'd, he'd stop in the shop from time to time and, and bought some of our pies up in a in a little market up at north of Northport where we deliver. So he got to know our pies first and then and then visited the shop and uh and now he's I think most of the summer most of the summer he's in residence up there just being a normal guy and doing normal things like eating pie at our shop. Well, going to visit uh, Good Morning America and ABC and having your pies featured all across the United States of America on that program. That's not uh <laughs> That's not the normal kind of stuff. That's very, very exciting. And after all, the pies are the star of the show, aren't they? Right. If it wasn't for the the quality of the pie, none of this would be happening. You know, in terms of our these these cool events or our, just our general you know ability to sell pie in 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 Michigan and Indiana. I mean, the, the pie has to has to stand up to the our wonderful uh, guests. Uh, Taste testers. So. Yeah. It's a great Michigan story. Now, is it George Stephanopoulos that hosts Good Morning America now? Is that yeah. who we... He's, he's one of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we'll so, make sure he gets a fork full of Michigan for yeah. us there. <laughs> and That's the, what we're hoping. So you can order Grand Traverse Pies if you're in New York City or Los Angeles mm-hmm. or Texas, whatever. How do you do that? You go to our website, mm-hmm. uh, and, it, and there's a place to order pies. You know, it's really neat. We just had a gal email us the other day she's going out flying out to alaska to cook a holiday dinner for some returning uh military folks up in up in alaska and asked wow. you know can can they she serve some of our pies so you know it's it's neat that we have this ability to ship pies because we're going to ship some pies up to alaska to some uh to a gal who's making a dinner for some returning uh servicemen and women yeah and so i guess you know we'll sell them but we'll also you know it's good to you know the goodwill of pie if we can yeah, we can spread the you know the warm feelings and the, our appreciation for even the military in this case, and that makes us feel pretty good. Yeah, and if you're going over the river and through the woods for Thanksgiving to grandmother's house, and uh, maybe it's out of the state, and you don't want to carry the pie on the airplane or you know have it go in the car with you, uh, you could ship it so it'll be there nice and uh, tidy when you arrive from Grand Traverse Pie Company. Well, have fun in the big city in New Thank York you. City, hanging around with George Stephanopoulos and the Good Morning America people, and thanks for all you do for Michigan. Well, thank you, Michael, for, Patrick, for having me on, and, uh, and hopefully everybody's uh, thinking of Thanksgiving here. He's an ambassador for the state of Michigan, Mike Busley from the Grand Traverse Pie Company, going on Good Morning America. It's Michael Patrick Shields. How about we talk a little politics when we get back? Join me, won't you? Ten minutes before the hour, my name is Michael Patrick Shields. Very nice to have you with us this morning. Um, Bringing you up to date quickly on what's been going on, uh, the Michigan governor-elect Republican Rick Snyder 
has chosen a longtime Lansing lobbyist to turn it, serve as his chief of staff. It's Dennis Muchmore, and that was announced yesterday. He's the former director of the Michigan United Conservation Clubs. He's 63 years old. He hasn't been on the government payroll in decades and uh, most recently was a partner at a top Lansing, Lansing lobbying firm. He retired about five years ago and is considered a moderate. He is coming back out. It's been rumored for a few weeks now. In fact, uh, in this clip of audio, this was all the way back on November 4th when MERSnews.com started reporting Dennis Muchmore's name, and I talked to John Truscott about the possibility of Mr. Muchmore being Governor Snyder's chief of staff, and here's what that sounded like. The gossip uh, that we heard yesterday is that Dennis Muchmore uh, may be the chief of staff for Governor-elect and then Governor Rick Snyder. Have you heard that? Uh, I have heard Dennis's name uh Governor Alex Snyder couldn't find anybody better than Dennis Muchmore. He's a wonderful person. He's been around. He's held numerous different positions, and he's just one smart guy. And, and he's the type of guy that Republican or Democrat, everybody around town loves him. Um, he's just he's one of the best. And I, I really hope for the administration, for the state, that it's, uh, that it's Dennis. There you have it, Dennis Muchmore. And a little bit after that interview with John Truscott, I ran into Dennis Muchmore at a tailgate party and his wife, Deb, at uh, Michigan State. And I asked him about it, and he said, well, they haven't called me, so I'm not sure. They may be looking at somebody else. But, no, it will be Dennis Muchmore, the chief of staff. Also, Geraldine Lasher will be the communications director for Governor Snyder, and she worked with Governor Angler all those years ago. Congratulations to her. She's a very nice lady, and we look forward to working to her with her at this program. By the way, we got a photo from uh, State Senator Jason Allen. You remember yesterday we talked to him in the morning. He was heading out to hunt. Right after the interview, he got himself a deer. Congratulations to Senator Allen. Um, Amanda Wall, your husband, Mike McGarry, is a hunter, so I saw something this morning that I didn't understand. I was in the Quality Dairy, okay, uh, getting some um, Tums, actually, if you must know. (laughs) (laughs) But anyway, uh, there was a guy in there, and he had um, a camouflage outfit on, Mm -hmm. but he had an orange vest. Bright orange. So what's the point in having a camouflage outfit if you're going to have an orange vest? You have to have orange on during firearm season so that People don't shoot hunters that are in the woods. Yeah, I get that. But but so, why would you bother to have camouflage stuff if you're going to be wearing a bright orange vest? I don't know. You know what I mean? Well, because you already have the camo gear. Like, when Mike goes out in bow season, he doesn't wear anything bright orange. He is all camouflage. But then, you know, he has to wear the bright orange because I want oh. him to come home safe. It just seemed kind of silly. Like, okay, your legs are camouflaged. Your upper body is uh, orange. Mm-hmm. Do the deer, do, is it? Can they see the orange I easier? Are they colorblind? I don't know. Can see color, oh. but I do know that turkeys can see color because I went hunting with Mike and I had bright red nail polish on and I pointed out the blind and the turkey ran away and really I haven't been back. You scared in away the, the turkey with the your nails. <laughs> or in the turkey <laughs> you blind got kicked thing. out. Yeah, but I have watched a lot of real tree road trips and monster bucks and I Are know those all the TV names shows? of the hunters and yeah, oh, oh yeah, Versus Channel has been on quite a bit. I see. Okay. <laughs> Tony. <laughs> Tony Cuthbert with the audio there says, let's move on. Okay, we will. Uh, back to politics. Nevada Democrat Harry Reid expected to remain Senate Majority Leader and Kentucky Republican Mitch McConnell should easily retain the post of uh, Senate Minority Leader, as we understand. There's going to be a royal wedding. I'm sorry, ladies, to break the news to you. Prince William has gotten engaged. It happened actually in October, but they released the news last night while you slept. A sneak attack. Kate Middleton. They've been dating for eight years. They met at college at the University of St. Andrews. They're both 28 years old. And uh, the wedding is going to be in spring or summer of 2011. So you may just want to save the date once you learn it in case your royal wedding invitation comes. The prince is second in line to the throne, and he proposed in Kenya when they were on vacation. So congratulations to Prince William, second in line to the throne, and Kate Middleton. A majority of Americans think Congress should extend the federal unemployment insurance benefits. According to a new poll, they reject the idea that deficit concerns should lead to cuts in support for the jobless when the unemployment rate is so high. That's what uh, a majority of Americans believe that you can't cut people off they need their jobless benefits their unemployment benefits and this is no time to be cutting those we never let the birthday of a beautiful woman pass without taking note lisa bonet is 43 
all those years ago on the Cosby Show in a different world, and now she's all grown up. And Maggie Gyllenhaal is uh, 33 from Crazy Heart, The Dark Knight, and uh, I'm not sure... Not sure she makes this list, to tell you the truth, now that I think about it. Anyway, she's 33, Lisa Bonet. Oh, Diana Krall, the jazz singer, is 46, the Canadian who plays the piano and sings at the same, same time such beautiful songs. All right, television viewers, thanks for being with us. Don't forget, tomorrow at the office of Dr. Christine Teneglia, she's my wife, the dentist, at Okemos and Bennett Rhodes, we will be having a book launch bash for my new book, Invite Yourself to the Party. There's going to be live music and uh, champagne and wine and hors d'oeuvres and lots of well-known people and people you know. There's no charge. Please join us anytime between 5 and 8 after work tomorrow at Okemos and Bennett Rhodes, the office of Dr. Christine Teneglia. You can get more details at inviteyourselftotheparty.com or, of course, all the information is always available at michigantalknetwork.com. Television viewers, thanks for being with us. Nice to see you this morning. And radio listeners, stay right where you are. We've got shocking news about exorcism when we get back. It's Michael Patrick Shields. Someone do